Operating aircraft from warships at sea effectively and safely is a capability that takes years of training, practice and experience to develop. This year, the Royal Navy celebrates 100 years of naval aviation. A centenary that not only recognizes the achievements, professionalism and spirit of the Royal Naval Air Service and Fleet Air Arm, but is a celebration of our nation's maritime aviation heritage. In an increasingly uncertain world, the UK's ability to protect its interests thousands of miles from our shores and airfields is fundamental to national and global security, and our ability to strike with global reach remains at the heart of national defence policy. The aircraft carrier, with its carrier air group, is the linchpin of expeditionary capability, a powerful and potent ship of the realm, enabling the UK to deter aggression and deliver war-winning combat effect whenever and wherever it chooses. Heralding a new era in carrier aviation, the future carriers, HMS Queen Elizabeth and HMS Prince of Wales, together with the F-35 Joint Combat Aircraft, Merlin Helicopters and Maritime Air Surveillance Aircraft, will deliver a formidable joint defence capability, carrier strike. Aircraft carriers are an invaluable strategic and political tool, giving the UK the flexibility and reach to deliver combat-ready capability at any time, anywhere in the world. The effectiveness of carrier air power was first proved in November 1940, when 21 swordfish biplanes took off from HMS Illustrious and destroyed the Italian fleet at Taranto. It was the first time an enemy fleet had been crippled from the air. Overnight, this daring attack altered the whole course of the war in the Mediterranean, and it was to be copied by the Japanese at Pearl Harbor. At its height in 1945, the fleet air arm comprised 78,000 people, 3,700 aircraft, 59 aircraft carriers, and 56 naval air stations around the world. In 1945, the Navy's celebrated test pilot, Captain Eric Brown, landed the first jet aircraft on the deck of an aircraft carrier. The pace of development of carrier aviation was rapid, and with the introduction of the high-speed strike aircraft of the 60s and 70s, the Scimitar, Sea Vixen, Phantom, Buccaneer and Sea Harriers, came innovative new British technologies. The steam catapult, the angled flight deck, the mirror landing site, and the ski jump. The fleet air arm has been at the forefront of operations around the world almost continuously. In the mid-90s, Royal Navy Sea Harriers played a major role in the UN air campaign in Bosnia. Four years later, Sea Harriers operating from HMS Invincible took part in the decisive airstrikes which ended the Serb occupation of Kosovo. Less than five years after the withdrawal of HMS Ark Royal in the late 1970s, Argentina invaded the Falkland Islands. With no land support and without the bombers, fighters and airborne early warning aircraft that a full carrier strike capability gives, the efforts to retake the Falklands were severely constrained. Sea Harriers in Hermes and Invincible destroyed 23 Argentine aircraft in air-to-air -air combat and a further 17 enemy aircraft were downed by ship air defence systems. I counted them all out, and I counted them all back. Their pilots were unhurt, cheerful and jubilant, giving thumbs-up signs. The lessons learned, however, were compelling. Although air supremacy was achieved, it was at a cost. Had the UK retained the deterrent effect of carrier capability, it is argued that fewer lives and ships would have been lost. The first helicopter deck landing on a Royal Navy ship was in 1946. Landing on a pitching, rolling deck in the middle of the ocean requires a unique set of skills, an intrinsic understanding of the nature of ships and the sea, and practice teamwork. The strength of naval aviation is its versatility and flexibility. A key role of naval helicopters is supporting expeditionary forces ashore. In 2000, naval squadrons operating from Illustrious and Ocean carried out amphibious landings in support of the UN peacekeeping operation in Sierra Leone. 
Naval aircraft operate in all environments. In 1962, in Malaya, naval air squadrons from Albion took to the jungle, operating with such skill and courage that the feats of the junglies became legendary. Today, over 80% of frontline fleet air arm squadrons are deployed on operations. The state-of-the-art Merlin helicopter is deployed on maritime surveillance operations in the northern Arabian Gulf and the Gulf of Oman. The Merlin will operate from the new aircraft carriers and is soon to be joined by another future generation helicopter, Future Lynx. Naval aviation is also making a direct contribution to joint operations in Afghanistan. For the fleet air arm and Royal Marines, deploying in support of land operations is integral to their expeditionary role. Naval Strike Wing Harriers have proved their outstanding effectiveness, providing close air support to coalition forces on the ground, and the Commando Helicopter Force is fulfilling an essential task, moving troops and equipment around the battlefield. Naval aircraft are also involved in maritime interdiction operations and counter-terrorism operations, monitoring for illegal weapons, safeguarding oil installations, and protecting commercial shipping from acts of piracy. And in the Caribbean, Lynx helicopters are working with law enforcement agencies on counter-narcotics operations. Naval aircraft are often first on the scene in crisis response operations. In 2006, Royal Navy helicopters assisted in the evacuation of over 4,000 civilians from war-torn Lebanon. The Sea King airborne surveillance and area control helicopter is always in demand. The aircraft's powerful sensors were used in Operation Telic to detect land vehicles, providing vital battlefield reconnaissance information. The early naval aviators were remarkable pioneers, enthusiastic and dedicated. Their bravery, ingenuity and good-humoured can-do approach has become the hallmark of the fleet air arm. At night, we flew with headlights. Maneuvering a SOP with PARP onto the platform had to be done with the ship steaming fast and the aircraft at minimum speed, almost stationary over the top. Then we were pulled down onto the deck by the sailors. It was all too easy to skid across the deck and fall over the side. This year's centenary celebrates the decision by the Admiralty in 1909 to place an order for an airship, His Majesty's Airship One. Aviation was in its infancy, but the airship offered reach, sustainability, payload, and, critically, the military advantage of being able to see over the horizon. It was a hugely transformational capability, and it was the introduction of that capability, naval aviation, 100 years ago, that makes 2009 such a significant naval centenary. When the First World War broke out five years later, the Navy was not only prepared, but in the vanguard to carry out the first strategic bombing from the air, the first air-to-air -air kill, the first sinking of a ship by torpedo from the air, and the first use of aircraft in a sea battle. The Royal Navy has never lost that vision, and 100 years later is still leading the way, playing a crucial role in UK defence commitments worldwide. Naval aviation is an integral part of the Royal Navy. Naval aircraft are part of the ship's weapon system, and the ship provides the operational infrastructure for the aircraft. The glorious history of naval aviation belongs as much to the chef and the coxswain as to the air crew, engineers and air gunners. This year's centenary is business as usual. The focus is on current operations. Delivering offensive air power from the sea will be a critical capability in the decades ahead, and the specialist knowledge and expertise to do this can come only from an aviation team that is continuously and inexorably linked with the ethos and experience of operating in the maritime environment. <laughs>